আমি শুরু করব Assalamu alaikum and good evening to everybody. Uh, today we are again meeting. Uh, there was a hiatus because of the uh, network problem last week. And today, as the COVID situation is worsening in the country, and many of our colleagues and friends are already affected. In cardiology, so far I know you have known Dr. Mahmudullah Firoj, uh, Dr. Mohsin Ahmed, Professor Mohsin Hussain, uh, Professor Khalid Mohsin, all three Mohsin are already affected. Uh, Professor Mamunur Rashid Sijar is also affected. Fortunately, all of them are having mild symptoms. In this situation, we have decided as the Ramjan is coming, uh, the next week before Ramjan will get a week. Uh, on that day, Professor Rafiq Sar, uh, will be presenting and then we'll have a hiatus for a month for the month of Ramadan. After Ramadan, we'll start again and hopefully by that time, COVID situation will improve. Today, Dr. Popi Bala uh, is going to present. I'm asking Professor Adaha Ali Sar to introduce Dr. Popi Bala. Uh, good evening and thank you, Professor Abdul Adud Choudhury. Dr. Poppy Bala is very much academic, sincere, leading electrophysiologist. He is going, she is going to be the second generation of electrophysiologist in our, in our country. She has been working as registrar in cardiology, electrophysiology, and heart failure. She is very much talent, extraordinarily brilliant, and she has got keen interest in ECG. So this is Dr. Poppy Bala, very young, upcoming electrophysiologist in our country. She has been already trained for the last two years and she can do the routine diagnostic electrophysiology. So Dr. Poppy Bala, she is going to present our today ECG cases. Dr. Poppy Bala, I am requesting you to present your cases. Dr. Poppy Bala. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Now I'm going to share my screen. Just make sure. Uh, I have to say Thing. Dr. Poppy is having a problem because uh, in her area uh, there was a transformer burst and so the current is not there. So we are going to see her presentation, but perhaps we'll be unable to see. Uh, please uh, accept that with our apology. Thank you, sir. Uh, my screen is visible, sir. Yes, please. Yes. Okay, good evening. Uh, good evening, our honorable panelists and large audience. I'm Dr. Poppy Bala from Ibarcare Hospital. I'd like to give my thank you to this is study group for giving me the opportunity, especially my mentor, Professor Atah Ali Sar, for asking me to present these cases in this forum. With the permission, and I also like to give the gratitude to the Professor Wadu Sar, Kiro Sar, and Sars from abroad, to Rofik Sar and Hafi Sar, and who are attending today's session, such as AQM Reza Sar, Tamji Sar, and others. With the permission of the chairperson, I would like to proceed my cases, sir. Okay, Papi. Yes, sir. Case one, a 67 years old male admitted to the Evercare Hospital, Dhaka, with a complaints of sudden onset of severe compressive chest pain, which radiates to left arm for three hours, associated with sweating, nausea, vertigo, and dizziness. On general examination, patient was hypertensive, around 60 to 40 millimeter of mercury, pulse 40 bit per minute. Uh, there is a crepitation in the lung basis. And the clinical past history, patient has a history of persistent atrial fibrillation, CKD, and patient is hypertensive. This was the ECG uh, taken in the emergency department showing with the well calibrated rate is around 46 bit per minute, rhythm is regular, narrow QRS complex, and there's the absence of POF before the QRS complex. QT is within the normal range and we can see there is a ST elevation in the V1 to V3 
and then T inversion V2 to V6 as well as the one and AVL. So the patient was diagnosed as a case of acute anterosteptal MI with a junctional rhythm. And here we can see there's a retrograde P wave, especially in the V4 to V6 in between the ACT segment. So patient is in junctional rhythm. Sir, do you want to have any comment about this ECC star or proceed to next one? Papi, you have given the history of persistent AF. Is yes, it? Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, persistent AF, sir. Then why do you think that change into a regular rhythm? Sir, most probably due to the sir, patient has a persistent AF. But in between time, patient uh, reverted back to the sinus. Why shouldn't we call it a paroxysmal AF then? Because it persisted more than seven days, sir, but within the 12 months in between. Patient has a history of persistent AF for a long time, but with the history, with the definition of the persistent AF, if the AF persisted more than seven days, but less than 12, that's why I am regarding this AF with a persistent AF, sir. Uh, was he getting any uh, digoxin? Uh, no, sir. In between times, sometimes he's getting amiodarone time to time. When it is reverted back to the sinus rhythm, he discontinues. Okay, the retrograde QF should be closer to the QRS complex. Why it is so far? That is the that is a nearly about more than 200 millisecond difference between the R and the retrograde QF. How can you explain this? Most probably, uh, uh, most probably, sir, it is due to the widespread the slowing of the conduction system. But if anyone has a comment about this, please, sir. Uh, uh, can I, uh, can you describe the ECG in a systematic way for the young audience that we have been encouraging all through, not just describing the uh, diagnosis. I want to have the full description, if you, if you please. Yes, sir. This patient has a well calibrated ECG with a rate 46 bit per minute and the rhythm is regular with a narrow QRS complex and absent of POS before the QRS and QT is within the normal limit, and there seems to be absence of POS before the QRS, but there is a retrograde POS can be seen, especially in the V4 to V6 in the ST segment, and there is a ST elevation in the V1 to V3, as well as T inversion in the V2 to V6, as well as 1 and AVM. Can I comment one thing? Yes, yes, I'm mean, welcome. Uh, uh, the uh, retrograde P wave demarcated by an arrow, it yes. corresponds with the with an artificial deflection in exactly. the uh, lid two uh, at the bottom in the rhythm state. So it is not probably the retrograde P wave. If it were, then it could be seen in other um, limb leads and other leads also. Or the V4, in V4, V5, look at the compress before. We don't see any inflection on the ST segment. Yes, yes. For V6, the first complex. Most the likely, uh, there is no discernible P wave in this ECG. Acha, Jamil, can you see the inverted P wave in the lead too? That is the rhythm strip. That is the. Something, uh, this something, something deflection, negative deflection in the rhythm strip in the lead. Uh, rhythm strip, this, this co correspond with the T waves in other leads. Might be this is inverted T wave. There is some undulation there. And that may be a buried P wave just um, uh, at the end of the ST segment where the uh, T wave begins. That but may be a buried uh, retrograde P wave. But the rhythm is junctional, no? Yes. Rhythm is junctional. No doubt I, about it. 
Uh, I want to draw your attention to V1, V2, V3. The first complex on the ascending limb of the uh, uh, T web seems to so uh, seem to have a deflection in there, a negative complex, perhaps. V1, V2, V3. Uh, very subtle at the middle of the ST segment, right? Yeah. Rafik, sir, your comment, please. Sorry, I'm here to wait to finish. I didn't know you got to buy any. Now, I said, I have an arrow point. I mean, it's hard to see P wave in this tracing. Yeah. And the last day, Error agedu ektamone chip wave moto. One possibility that you have to consider that maybe it is still actual fibrillation, fine a fib with complete heart block. Uh, that's one possibility. Or junctional rhythm. Or uh, arrow point, I mean, normally, imagine you have to consistently present before you can make a comment. And the baseline, there is a shift. Because um, eight am are difficult. To, uh, to understand that wave. Uh, sir, V1, V2, uh, uh, there is a, a, a deflection in there. So, uh, Atharvai, can I talk a little bit? Sure. So, um, when we read EKGs, let me uh, compare this with the angiogram. Because when we read angiogram, sometimes the fellows tell me, oh, there is a septal stenosis. Uh, and I, I said, you know, stop it. Don't read too much on the septal. Look at the big picture. And I think we are spending too much time about retrograde fear. I, I think this is artifact. This is not retrograde. The bigger picture is that this is a fixed RR, and there is a significant STT changes in the precordial list with the chest pain. So this is very important that we don't we focus on the bigger picture in this EKG because there is a huge management issues. So, you know, there's somebody with a AFE with, with a fixed RR, then, you know, was the patient on ditch now coming with junctional? Uh, and, or is this that there is a bigger thing happening with the uh, inf ischemia infarct? And that is a bigger trouble. So I would not worry too much, you know, you know, those who are in the EP, then they can think about a lot of uh, details. But for general cardiology and for management purposes, let's look at the bigger picture, what is happening. This is a huge problem in the uh, LAD territory and uh, patient is injunctional. So once we know that, then we can think about how to manage this patient. People going to that, uh, Poppy, next slide, please. No, let, let me make a comment about this. I don't think we should bring up the issue of EP, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The question is: This is an ECG session. What is the diagnosis? Because we are having, we are trying to have not only clinical management. Or this is not an intervention session. This is not a management session. This is an ECG teaching session. Question is: Yes, the bigger picture is acute anterior MI. What is the rhythm? Is it a junctional rhythm? I think. As Hafiz pointed out, that probably to think simple. One is um, atrial fibrillation with complete heart, but very fine atrial fibrillation, or just a junction rhythm. Patient may have concert, converted into a atrial standstill with junction rhythm. Thank you. Okay, Poppy. Yes, sir. So because it is in the COVID era, so we decided to counsel the patient for the thrombolysis and send the patient to the CCO. When patient, sorry, sir. When patient came into the CCO, then we did the ECG again. It shows suddenly widening of the QR complex and red goes up from 46 to 74. Also, we can see there is a ST elevation in the P and ABS. So and now the question, yes, sir. 
So now the question is, what is the rhythm? Whether this is a accelerated junctional rhythm with RDDB or accelerated idioventricular rhythm. Ms. Bibu, you can put a poll for this after 30 seconds. Chaudhary, Abdullah Chaudhary. Is this, was this ECG taken before thrombolysis or after thrombolysis? Before, before, uh, before sir. Uh, it is weekend, before 10. I will draw at you one thing. Sometimes okay. our okay. starts uh, look at the AVR when getting this ECG and they slight ST elevation, they think it's uh, uh, left in involvement. Remember that if you have bundle branch block, then that AVR elevation is uh, not appropriate. You cannot consider that. So this is a bundle branch block with no PF discernible. So the question is appropriate. Is it a different rhythm or is it accelerated junctional rhythm? So the, are these not the PUA in the lead, rhythm strip lead to bottom? That is the negative deflection after the QRS complex. One is to one. Uh, yes, 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 you are right. Notching, notching at the uh, descending limb of the R wave in V2. Looking for the same thing in the uh, limb lead. In V6, there seems to be a deflection in there. V6, yes. Okay. So also in the rhythm strip at the end of the QRS complex, there is a negative deflection. Deflection. So that goes more in favor of? Junction or rhythm. Either way, isn't it? One is to one conduction. Yeah. One is Again, That's Professor. Uh, it, we have to go back to the formula of um, VT diagnosis. Yes. If you look at lead one, that is the R wave followed by S looks like right bundle. But in the chest lead, it is concordance yes. from V1 to V6. Yes. So it's, it's an it's a accelerated idioventricular rhythm. Yes. I mean, it's simple. The question is that, I to the intervention guy's question, is there is ST elevation in 3 and AVF? Is yes, it just sir. because of the premature weight, or uh, do we make anything out of that? Yes, sir. That's our question, sir. A change in the ACG, uh, that actually rules out a digoxin toxicity or anything like that. That goes in favor of acute amide. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's move. Okay, sir. Next, Bobby. Uh, moving on. After giving, okay, then the next question is, why is the lesion? Okay. So, what? so, so yes. this is important to recognize this EKG because I know that I get emotional about making comments, but if we recognize this rhythm and the implication is following, because if it is accelerated idioventricular rhythm, then is it part of the reperfusion or is it a new insult that giving this picture? Yes. I have a question for Hafiz. Let's let's make an assumption. This is an accelerated rhythm. That is to elevation. Shall I consider that as part of that just a ventricular beat, or is this of any significance in three and AVF ST elevation? But the same patient has got the ST elevation in precordial leads are initial in the first ECG. Yes, exactly. So the and, issue and, is and again, where the perfusion rhythm, uh, if it is, then it is spontaneous reperfusion as if this session was taken before the tenectic plane. Uh, can, can I get, take some imagination? Let's consider it's a type 4 LED, the lesion yeah. LED, mm -hmm. but continuously uh, compass is getting shifted downwards. In that type of LED, uh, there will be a, a ECG change in the inferior leads. So imagine that this is a uh, post perfusion arrhythmia, or is a new issue, then how to differentiate, right? And then if it is a accelerated idioventricular and perfusion arrhythmias, 
the sometimes it may look ugly or ugly are but it may not be that of an issue and then important thing is that that is one working diagnosis and then we can have a differential diagnosis differential diagnosis is what else it can be can it be a new right bundle and then coming with junctional rhythm that is alternative diagnosis that we can also think about if that is the case that means is it a worsening prox lad now coming with new right bundle and then ekg changes and then anatomically we can explain why the lad into the right sided perf uh, area perfusion giving this picture so May I ask if this are the copy yes sir uh, sorry uh, habis bhai uh, was the was there a chest chest pain was resolved by the time you did the second ecg no sir still no, persisted no, ch chest pain continued continued, uh, continued okay. chest pain with a so, hypotension and a features of failure sir still okay persisted. so it doesn't uh, look like a reperfusion arrhythmia like a idiopathic idiopathic rhythm with a recanalized lady oh, okay mm -hmm. habis please continue so i mean that was my next move that what how if we think about that then we need to think about that whether the, the, the lytics failed and it is gotten worse a lytic has not been given for lytic oh so the, so the, the, if lytics has not been given then no no then sir is, still not given yeah then it is even worse yeah. then, yes. then, they, then there is no point in entertaining perfusionary because and then if you look at the right bundle we can still read right bundle and st changes the worry something is that 3 abf has clearly st elevation as well so th this is this is um, i would call it dire situation yes, sir. sir do we move on to the next slide sir yes please okay. and for okay. the for the junior guys i think it is very important that if there is no reperfusion then i would not entertain the diagnosis of reperfusion arrhythmia and suddenly in the middle of an mi we don't normally see an acute idioventricular rhythm unless there is a reperfusion so that makes it easy thank you sir, thank you, sir. Uh, after giving the tenicky place we can see there is a narrowing of the qrs complex and rate is also goes down to 46 bit per minute and there here we can see there the st elevation still persisting in the v1 to v3 and some v4 as well as c and av these are the marking of the external pacemaker because of the tenicky phase bp is still not improved so we decided to go for the external pacemaker because this is the obidera but patient okay, today may, may, I, may i stop you there yeah, because yes, if you are this is very very important we actually gone through this experience badly in the early part of the covid that we thought that giving lytics even acc championed this idea that why not load lytics we soon realized that particularly some patients were you know patient is impending shock or requiring temporary wear by giving lytics is not going to cut it and this patient had such a profound ekg changes i'm wondering the patient is in a pci hospital yes sir I mean, this is a this is a pci hospital to go to, go to ha intervention hafiz the problem is we do not have dedicated cath lab and dedicated team and that's the situation in bangladesh we have to do what we have that is the problem we don't have uh, well, well what i'm saying was this problem that we are trying to avoid not to go to the cath lab you will end up going to the cath lab watch this case yes sir. i don't know the case but i'm <laughs> i'm actually anticipating that this case will ultimately go to the cath lab but the problem is logistic that's why we are in problem that i'm saying the, the logistic is there but in a, in a selected cases where it is you will not be you, you can guess that it's preemptively it is better off going to the cath lab and the other thing is that 
this dedicated cat lab is not needed. Well, that we can we can talk about that. We have learned this. Next, Bobby. Yes, sir. Happy, sir. You are right because patient couldn't tolerate the high output. Ultimately, we decided to take the patient to the cat lab for the invasive TPM. Before we could do anything, uh, patient developed atrial fibrillation that time. But the in yes, sir. With the development of the atrial fibrillation, which is evidenced by the irregular rhythm, absent P wave, and at a rate of 107. But interesting thing is the ST elevation result in the anterior precordial leaf, but still persisted in the C and ABS with a widespread T inversion. So we you, move this. Yes, sir. Did you do the NGO? No, sir. We waited for the COVID results, sir. That's the problem in our country. We are doing at most the TPA temporary pacemaker, but we are not doing the uh, primary PCI. That's what should have been done, but that's the problem. Yes, sir. So, then, how, now? Yes, sir. No, no, nothing, sir. How is the patient now? Now, patient is good. Ultimately, patient survives, and at night, patient develops ventricular tachycardia. Mm -hmm. We have to give the DC cardio version and revert it back to the rhythm after fibrillation. And ultimately, after getting the COVID result, we decided to do the angiogram. Mm -hmm. It shows there is a diffuse disease in the LCX. And interestingly, there is no significant lesion in the LAD. Some moderate coronary artery disease in the midsection. Followed by same LCX view. And this is the RCA showing a 100% occlusion is present in the midsection of the RCA. Because we did an uh, echocardiogram before that, and there's a regional wall motion abnormality in the inferior wall. So this is the infarct related artery. So ultimately we decided to put a stent in this coronary. After stenting, we can see this is a huge RCA extended up to the apex and some branch can be seen supplying in the lateral wall also. And patient is now good, sir. This is the ECG after the stenting. There's a resolution of the ST elevation in the C and AVA, but development of the C Wave and the AF is still persisted with the T inversion also reduced than before. So now the question is what is the explanation behind the ECG? So with the RDB ST elevation in the precordial lead followed by subsequent ECG. Well, one of the thing, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Now, even though there is no ST elevation in the initial ECG, and your diagnosis of permanent AFib, I think the patient is in permanent AFib with fine atrial fib because as evidenced by this ECG, the last ECG, yes. is atrial fibrillation. So patient actually went into complete heart block with junctional escape bit that we see normally with acute inferior MI. But interestingly, in the base, first ECG, there was no ST elevation. And of course, the second ECG, which was a idioventricular rhythm, there is a ST elevation. But it's difficult to make anything out of it. But I think the heart block can be explained by the right coronary artery involvement. Yes. Sir, what is the explanation of ST? Wadu Chaudhary, the ST elevation in precordial lead in the first ECG. Uh, Popi, yes, did sir. a muscle bridging effect in the LED mid segment? Most Go. Probably. Okay, yeah. sir. I'm going back. Go back to LED. Before that, sir. Okay. The one before. Look at this muscle breathing effect. 
systole constriction in the mid segment was so it, mu- so it might be because there is no q wave in the mid section so it can be a muscle breach uh, was it because it that segment also contains a two or three big septal branches sir was it responsible for these changes exaggerated uh, uh, constriction spasm you are talking about the accelerated interventricular rhythm uh, no sir the change in the st segment change oh, I, i don't know that is your domain of <laughs> but i think it I mean, it is tough but if you look at the ekg the very fast um one can say that this was like a biphasic t wallen sign when yeah. the wallen sign is like very vivid then it can look like a stemi mimic yeah uh, and so if you look yeah. yeah look at this this is biphasic typical wallen style yeah and the patient has chest pain you know so uh, it's difficult to say but this this uh, rr interval is Uh, you know very regular to me i did not measure it but it looks like junctional with with uh, wallens and usually anterior wall if it is comes with lid either bad news or there is a coexistent right coronary problem yes and then it evolved into right coronary uh, uh one thing i'll be asking rafik sir when A, a patient of af can show regularity one is a due to complete heart block and the escape rhythm is the regular rhythm and uh junctional rhythm which we can see as a result of deoxin toxicity is it not sir is there any other cause absolutely i mean when you say junctional rhythm with deoxin toxicity that's actually a complete heart block yes the so basically af with complete heart block will give a regular rhythm or rarely if you develop atrial standstill after a fib and you have junctional escape that can those are the only two situation where you will get regulated but i think in this case probably the rca involvement was the question yeah. the other question to you all hafiz and uh, wadud uh, that is it possible that there is a clot in the led that dissolved <laughs> million dollar question no i mean look at this st elevation i mean this is nobody everybody would say this is acute anterior myocardial infarction right yes with this elevation no question about it but how how do you explain that rovik but that's a very valid question particularly in the covid time right because yes. whether this is the someone can say i'm worried and that it was probably covid and then but now this patient was covid negative so yes. before we go to the cath lab and before we are in trouble one of the thing we have found very helpful is to look at the Uh, patient's clinical presentation chest x-ray and the bedside echo bedside echo covid uh, uh, deceiving us has been a lot of patients with a lot of ekg changes but we see a pattern in the echo like a covid related inflammatory uh, cytokine mediated injury pattern and then takasubu like apical ballooning reverse takasubu mid ventricular takasubu but when there is a regional pattern and there is chest x ray is clean then usually these patients and there is no history then it is usually better to better off to think about that this is not covid and then reasonable to take to the cath lab but if there is any doubt we have managed many patients without taking to the cath lab despite the ekg changes because the echo was suggestive of apical ballooning i'm saying apical ballooning but there are other varieties it is important to recognize those varieties of takasubu in the covid time so we can avoid unnecessary cases but in this case ekg and the way it evolved and i'm sure the bedside would have helped uh, the regional wall motion pattern all favoring uh, st elevation mi thank you sir copy nice thank you sir thank you then i will proceed to the next case sir now the second case 
this case is courtesy by the Dr. Kazi Atiku Rahman sir. These are the history dated back to 2016 till to this day. And we are in a hard and rock places. So really in need of your expert opinion, sir, regarding this case. So this history started at the year of April 2016. And 55 years old diabetic, normal sensitive female, admitted into the hospital with chest pain which radiates to raised arm, associated with dizziness, shortness of breath, and vomiting. On general examination, patient's B2 of normal, pulse is 190 beats per minute, and there are the features of heart failure. On the background history, patient is diabetic, dyslipidemic, and also renal impairment present. This was the ECG taken in the emergency department. Uh, sorry, sir, for the poor quality of the ECG, but this is ECG taken in the 2016, so the marking was fading away. So this ECG shows the rate is 194 bit per minute, rhythm is regular, with a narrow QRS complex. So it is diagnosed as a case of narrow complex tachycardia. So now the question is whether it is a heavy NRT, AVRT, atrial flutter, or ventricular tachycardia. Sir. Go back to ECG, Papi. Yes, sir. CG. You can check for the RP interval. Is it longer or shorter? RP interval can check sir, there. There seems to be AV dissociation. So that's okay, why you are confused. In the V1, right. you can say there's a P, and in L2, there seems to be these are C. Mm -hmm. Now, so, what is the QRS complex white? Sir, white is uh, 80 milliseconds highest, sir. We can measure it in L2. And others are less than that. So is, I want to know from Ropik, sir, sir, how to measure the QRS complex here in such situation? QRS duration. It doesn't look like it. It's more than that. Sir, it's well, counting is lead to, sir. <laughs> That's why, sir. Okay, Ropik, sir. Yeah. Well, the, the, the problem is, if you look at the QRS, the width changes, and probably there is an overlap with the P wave. While it looks wide, probably there is a P wave preceding that. But if you look at lead two, the QRS is approximately 100, three boxes, 120 milliseconds. 20 milliseconds, right. Oh. Yes. So it's not, it looks narrowish. Yeah. Other okay. problem, as you mentioned about the AV dissociation, I think that looks like AV dissociation to me. Yeah. Uh, so if there is AV dissociation uh, with this and with a regular RR interval, you have to consider a narrow QRS ventricular tachycardia. Yes. Um, yes, sir. It seems to be a narrow complex regular ventricular tachycardia, sir. But during that time, this patient was diagnosed as a case of SVT. So the injection adenosine was given, but it didn't work. After that, injection where five milligram was given. And with the five milligram verapamil, uh, it is diverted back to the sinus rhythm. This is the after conversion, which is some um, ectopis can be seen. Ectopis can be seen with a pause and there seems to be, we can see there is a P, inverted P in the V3. It is conducted and there is a pause. So we regard this complex as a uh, ectopic complex. So I have a question, whether it can be a WPW, yeah. because, because there is a flooding and the QRS is exists change from positive to fully negative. From this ECG, no. The previous ECG. Dr. Poppy. Yes, sir. The, the yellow circle complex. Yes, sir. You are considering as ectopic bit? Yes, sir. Because in the VC, in, we in can... In ectopic bit, it's not possible to say yeah. whether it is uh, yeah. excitation or not. You're not. You need I... to have a clean-cut P-web 
then QRS complex, then you can decide whether there is shortening of PR interval, whether there is a delta wave, etc. Um, in ectopic bit, it's not possible. Um, then my question is, is can be uh, whether the exit can be changed, the conducted this ectopic bit when conducted to the ventricle? Because uh, before yeah. that, QRS this, is... This, this ectopic bit originates from the ventricular side. Not from the actual. Okay. Can I make a comment? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. The black circle, that bit is clearly premature. The yellow circle, the timing is such, it you have to entertain both. You have to entertain yes, ventricular sir. premature bit or intermittent pre-excitation. Because the timing is such that if 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 there is intermittent pre-excitation with the accessory pathway, it can look like that, or a ventricular premature bit. Now, can it, can it be a fusion bit, sir? Fusion of uh, yes, PVC with fusion, yes. yes sir. But but in, you cannot ignore. So you have to entertain both. But the previous is during the tachycardia. That if that were a WPW syndrome, white QRS tachycardia, it would have been much wider. Yes. Uh, I mean the orthodromic um, um, tachycardia, uh, antidromic. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. Some, some leads, no, uh, but, that is delta waves. Yes, but if you look at V1 and V2, it looks exactly like the beat with the yellow circle. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that actually makes me feel more like that this is a um, ventricular tachycardia. Because usually, if you are uh, accessory pathway conduction uh, tachycardia, that that looks much wide, much much wider because that will be. You have to imagine something. If it is a tachycardia going down the accessory pathway coming back, it will be looked like the widest PVC because it is it is activating lateral side of the ventricle somewhere. It will look very wide. So, to me, I mean, uh, I can be wrong, but uh, the first one is uh, probably an arrow can this presence of this yellow circle bit supports uh, that further. What did but you it, find? It is a, Rovik, but if it is a BT, then it is a Brapamil sensitive BT because Brapamil did break it. Exactly. The only, only part that's against it, all the Brapamil sensitive BT, majority of them comes from the left ventricle. Then it should have looked like right bundle. So that's the aberration part. But as you said, Hafiz said that it's very can it sensitive. Be a septal? Can it be a septal? Yes, it's, it's possible. Yes. But it, it does not look like it, it doesn't look but it doesn't look like any, it does not look like fascicular. It looks like little narrowish, uh, like narrowish VT. Oh yes, yes, no question about it. No question. The interesting part is Hafiz. First time I went to Bangladesh in 2000, I looked at ECGs. Bangladesh is full of narrow QRS VT. In America, in 20 years, I did not see probably five. I went to Bangladesh in one day, I saw five narrow QRS VT. So what, what is was the final diagnosis? We are all discussing this. No, I mean, I mean, EKG, on I mean, Young years ago, the bully, it, it becomes like intimidating. What I, I don't get me wrong, I, I'm tough on this because I want to make sure that the if, junior physicians they don't feel intimidated. Have it, you know, call it a you know a SVT narrow complex or a narrow HVT. Have the differential. We don't need to be right. We have the differential diagnosis in our mind. I think that's good enough, Rafiq, right? That's what, Hafiz, that's what we have been practicing last one year, that we have a differential diagnosis. Think simple. Well, that, 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 that. That's why I make comments and jokes. Don't take it seriously. <laughs> so get, this patient, get a cat. If the cat is negative, go for further. Uh, there oh. are lots of history left, sir, for this case. OK, go ahead. Okay. So, how old was the patient? 55, right? During that time, 52, sir. Okay, 52, okay. 
it is, it, it is a, continuing to 2021. Yeah. There's a long history. Sir. So generally, when you present a case like this, the story just unfolding. So everybody hold your breath. <laughs> okay, sir. Uh, proceed, sir. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Yes, sir. Then the patient who was diagnosed as a case of non HTMI with SBT, diabetes mellitus, renal impairment. Because tropia is uh, 10 times higher than the normal. And the echo was done during that time, showing there is a global hypopyrmesia with the EF 35%, PVR RV dysfunction with the RA, RV, and PH dialysis. So we advised the patient for the CAD, but they declined and got discharged from the hospital. Now the ongoing history, four months later, patient ultimately did the angiogram in another hospital. They found the mild coronary artery disease and they put the patient on the MRI due to the frequent PVC. And 2017, patient started earning and the water shows multiple PVC with a low 5.8% and 6,000 per 24 hours. At the end of the 2017, patient came to OPD with a complaint of weakness. In the OPD, patient suddenly went into the cardiac area and we rushed the patient into the ER. Sorry again, sir, because there is so no marking. Can you go back? Can you go back? Please, please. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so don't go to the next. I think we need to, as it evolves, we need to be very clear uh, each step. So CAG mild and amiodarone was given with the EF. So that's, oh, I wanted to know, anybody has any comment? I am very particular about not giving amiodarone in this situation. So I think there are a few things. And then, to talk, then when you see the, the RV dilated and PA pressure high, then we need to think about what is going on there. Is it enough to explain? Because if the observation from the echo is right. So this is very important that then. And then and every time we see this follow-up, we need to think about that what's going on. Have we got the diagnosis? Are we calling it a, a CAD related cardiomyopathy, ischemic cardiomyopathy, or, or we call it non ischemic cardiomyopathy? If it is a non ischemic cardiomyopathy, then what is the most likely diagnosis for the non ischemic cardiomyopathy? You know, PVC, tachycardia, mediated cardiomyopathy possible. Is that the, that the diagnosis we are, we are doing? We don't know. So, the, and in the meantime, have we done enough to protect the patient? Is the follow-up echo, is the substrate still there? And is the follow-up echo showing that the EF is getting better or RV is getting worse? We have none. And then suddenly we have a cardiac arrest. Things do not happen because it is destined to happen. Things happen because we did not predict enough. And you, uh, okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, this was the ECG, so there is no marking. Just I want to show for just for the reference. This was the ECG was taken just before one day before the cardiac arrest, showing the rate is really low with the sinus bradycardia at the rate of 25 bits per minute with some ectopic. Poppy, so, can question? Yes, sir. Yes. For starting emitter, did they do any halter? Why emitter? Because but, of ECG. Because, sir, as far as I know, it was starting at the outside of the another hospital. They saw the frequent PVC, and they also did the water later on. So for that, most probably they started emergency. But I think uh, we should be clear about this. Uh, okay, can I ask one thing? Uh, uh, did, did the halter, uh, what was the rate of the ever, average rate of the heart rate throughout the halter monitoring? Throughout the water monitoring, sir, around 89 to 90 bit per day. Ever is hurt. And uh, number of PVCs per. Sir, that shows the PVC load is 5.8 percent. The 6,000 per 24 hours. When the patient was on amiodarone, isn't it? Yes, sir. And it, the it, it was on amiodarone or without amiodarone? Sir, during that time, patient was getting amiodarone. That halter. They start. Yes, 
Amit Arun in 2016, is uh, it? Yes, sir. 2016 and the order was done October 2017. One year. In 2016, was there any order done? Sir, I, do, I didn't get the, any other. Okay. So the, this was a, uh, yes, sir. Uh, for yes. this low yes. low rate of PVC, uh, 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 I think nothing should be done. Uh, 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 no, uh, no drug treatment should be done. Abdullah Jamil Bhai, can I make a point? Sure. For the juniors, you should remember that a PVC alone very unlikely to produce cardiomyopathy unless the load is high. How much? Around 20%. Yeah. And it can produce LV dysfunction. And then the treatment is not a meter on. You ablate the uh, a, a focus uh, by a radio frequency ablation, and then the ejection fraction can improve. Records say up to 12% can improve. Professor, am I wrong? Uh, that, that is um, with the PVC and cardiomyopathy. The question is which one came first? Um, but we have seen patients ejection fraction 40, 45% with frequent PVC on optimal heart failure medication and after PVC ablation ejection fraction improve. I mean, uh, as random, but I think data is still evolving on that. I mean, just PVC, uh, <clears throat> this patient is interesting. Let's continue, finish it, and then I'll, I'll have some comments. Okay, sir. <clears throat> then we did the TSS level, and it was quite high. So the sinus bradycardia moved due to this amadaron induced hypothyroidism. And the ECO was still 35, so we again decided and advised the patient for the real in the AICD. But again, they refused and got discharged from the hospital. Now the story going on for the 2017-2020. During this time, the LV ejection function is improving from 35 to 50 percent, but still oh. RV function dysfunction persisted. And there is a one episode of RV okay. from us. Can you stop, please? Before yes, you further, because there is a reason I want you to stop. Let's go back on the slides. The first echo. No, continue back backward. I'll stop you when you. There is a reason I stopped you there. Can you go back, please? Okay, go back, please. Go back, please. Back again. Okay. Uh, so now, can you move forward again from the first ECG onward? Next. Next one, please. Next. Okay. So now go back, please. This one, yeah. Okay. So this is a relatively um, young person with a narrow QRS tachycardia, which we think is ventricular tachycardia. Minimal elevation troponin, in. And of course, as Hafiz mentioned, we will definitely do a cath first. And then the echo showed RV dysfunction. And one of the things that we must consider will be arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. Yes. And that is a point where I should have strongly recommended, I mean, definitely I would like to know the coronary status first, and then a cardiac MRI. Yes. And, and, that, uh, and the clue, this is very, very clear. RV dysfunction, normally you do not see uh, a lot of, but there is RV dilated and there is RV dysfunction. Continue. Rose, please, please. The biggest clue was we had the fact in front of us that the Verapamil did break the VT. Or if you, you know, and, and that is huge because that is a huge clue. And I think we missed that clue. Because we never thought that this is be a coronary, right? We do the VT and this, the, the organic VT from the CAD substrate almost never is sensitive to VT, Verapam. Uh, for the young nurse, actually what uh, Hafiz Bhai is uh, 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 pointing that Verapam means sensitive VT that usually arises from the RV output track and and in those cases, you should consider, uh, is there any uh, anything that into dysplasia or something like that? But and and remember, what was, we, we, we did see the RV dilatation, right? Yeah. And so, so this is like a Scotland yard. 
the the every offense they leave a sign. You have to chase that. Okay. With so, all fairness, let me point out one thing. Sir. With all fairness to the physician who took care of that patient at that time, the QRS looks narrow. It didn't stop with adenosine. It stopped with verapamil. He may have thought this is an SVT which stopped with verapamil. That's the whole point, that narrow QRS tachycardia stopping with adenosine, uh, didn't stop with adenosine, stopped with verapamil. You have to keep that in mind. So please remember that, yes, it could have been an SVT, but there is also a VT which can stop with, uh, with verapamil. And that's, that's the point of this uh, thing that, that a verapamil sensitive VT, and it has happened here. I have patients who came with a right bundle tachycardia. Patient had a baseline right bundle. And the white QRS tachycardia was exactly the same as sinus rhythm QRS complexes with right bundle. Did not stop with amiodar, uh, sorry, adenosine, stopped with delta IgM, and everybody thought that this was SVT with underlying right bundle. But then when you did the electrophysiology study, it was interesting that this was actually a VT. And then we looked back and then found out there is a subtle difference in the ECG. So I think that's a very as, as I have it. So Rovik, let me let me tell you this. This is the part. I give the compliment to the EP. We, we, the general cardiology, you know, we cannot have both ways. If we are saying that this is VT, then we are smart, we are addressing that. If we are saying this is SVT, then the SVT, we cannot explain this situation with the EF low and the RV dilated. So at that point, if I'm the general cardiologist, I will ask for somebody with the cerebral cortex. Because generally, cardiology, we work on brainstem. And EP guys, they have the cerebral okay. cortex. So yeah. All right. if Let's you go to the last slide. That, you, you think that I get, I blast the EP. No, I actually compliment the EP. This was a tough case. If you think about yes. that. No, no, no. Hafiz, it's not the question of EP, non EP intervention. This is the ECG. Session. No, no, no. <laughs> this has to be a logical thinking. No. It has to be a logical thinking. Like we cannot say. have both ways. No, no, no. You have to understand this. When the international guys spend hours on this obtuse marginal branches sub-branch, we don't say anything about it. I mean, I don't. No, I don't. I, let me let me talk about the subject. <laughs> international guys keep babbling about this tiny vessel. Well, general cardiologists have no clue. Type four lesion. Ask, you know, you keep talking about type four lesion. Ask 200 cardiologists in Bangladesh how many understand what, what is the meaning of type four. It I want the audience to look at the bigger picture. This exactly. guy was in bigger trouble. Cat was done. Cat cannot explain the ear. So this is a bigger trouble with this arrhythmia. So then ask for help. No. But knowing but, that when to ask for help is a good thing. Okay. Other thing we also have to remember, even though we are saying everything is linked together, sometimes they can be independent. Somebody can have a left-sided non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with ARVD, who also ha happen to have SVT. So these are all the things that we need to remember in our, not, not that everything is related to each other. So let's move from this one. So what did you do with the MRI? Yes, sir. Then the ejection fraction is improved with a dense one episode of Abhishamba, which was treated with anticoagulation warfarin. And now fast forward to 2021, the January, patient again admitted in our hospital with a VT and reverted back. And then again, they got discharged. And ultimately, patient decided to do the cardiac emergency. Okay, so so they, before you go okay. there, it's important because RV thrombus is not a simple thing. When you see RV thrombus, you need to think about few differential. Any comment? The comment? Sir, is this a question for me, sir? Sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the reasons might be due to the severe RV dysfunction. As the sir said, it 
can be number one, the ARBD is one of the first. And other might be the GCM, but it is not a GCM because the LB function is. So eosinophilic myocarditis and then also the chagas. So these are very important to think about because RB thrombus is not a simple thing. You can pick the vast majority of the RB dilatation that we see from the left sided, we don't normally see RB thrombus. I'm excluding the catheter related RB issues, you know. Thank you. Sir. Move on, sir, from the next point. That was it. Yes. Now, at present, and the first March 2021, patient came again with a palpitation for several days. And this was the ECG this time around. And this shows there's a rate is around 145 big per minute, they with a AVR is positive and some AV dissociation can be seen in the all lead, especially in the lead two here, here we can see the AV dissociation. So the patient was diagnosed with a case of ventricular tachycardia this time around. With a, in V1, the RBB is morphology. So it most probably came from the left side and there is a superior AV, so it means that the CC AVF is negative. So most it is from the epical side. So do you want to give any comments or I put it in a slide, sir? Uh, was there any electrolyte abnormality? No, sir. The potassium and magnesium is all normal. Patient is getting is still amateuron all these years? No, they stopped the amateuron when we diagnosed the patient as a case of hypothyroidism. That time they discontinued the amateur. Now the poppy, the patient has got the VT initial VT was R L B morphology. Now it is R B B morphology. Yes, sir. Topic, sir. No, I mean it's coming from probably as you know, it's possible that it was in the septal location to start with. And um, it's just coming from the left ventricular apex. <clears throat> what is that? Next problem. Because the patient was stable, so we again give patient the amadurone. After one day after giving amadurone, the rhythm was converted back to the sinus rhythm. In the background, the patient has a severe RV dysfunction, RV thromba, with a quite good LV function, around 50%, with the recurrent VT. And so we look for the, any evidence of the ARBD. So there seems to be incomplete RBD pattern in the uh, V1 to V2 we can see, and there the knob can be located in the V3 after QRS complex. So we decided to magnify the lead. After magnification, there seems to be an incomplete RBD pattern with the excellent wave in the V2 and V3, especially at the end of the QRS complex. And there's a reference in the side by side. In the there, we can see it is almost look like the type B morphology here. So, do we want to comment about this issue, sir? Or do we proceed, sir? So, in case of the ARVT is defining, we can see the team version in the right tutorial list from V1 to V3. In the absence of RBD, it can be found in the 85% of the patient. Epsilon wave, 50% uh, of the patient can have that. Localized QRS widening in the V1 to V3, more than 110 milliseconds. And the prolonged ASF outstroke, especially that's called the terminal activation time, it is more than 55 milliseconds in V1 to V3. These all are the findings of the ARVD. So after that, we did the ECO. The LV function seems quite good, but with a large RV thrombus is hanging from the lateral side of the RV. So 
So the EF is 50, around 50 percent with a tap free eight millimeter. After one to two hours later, patient develops the multiple ectopy in the form of bivimia. Followed by the VT started again. But this time round, we can say this is the LBB morphology with a super exit type of ventricular tachycardia with a AVD situation. So, do I move on to next slide? Yes, next slide. So, from that enough case, in the 2010. These are, these, are, these are all after phenomena, right? Chorpalale <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. So, we gave the patient advice again and again for AICD, CAV, and every other. But patient declined day after day, again and again. But again and again, they admit into the hospital, stayed for 22 days, and got discharged or DRP. So this was out of our hands. So in our case, in the task force 2010 criteria, our patient has the major criteria, the RV dysfunction, with a RVOT more than 34 millimeter in the plaque. Second criteria in the major is inverted TUA. TUA in the absence of complete RDD, presence of epsilon wave from V1 to V3, and then in the arrhythmia criteria, the ventricular tachycardia of the LVV morphology is superior to, but patient doesn't have any family history. So to tell, uh, to diagnose the patient as the case of arrhythmogenic radiological dysplasia, or definitely diagnosis, two major, one major with a two minor or four minor, criteria should be made. But in our case, we have four major criteria. So clinically, we, we diagnose the case as a asthmogenic radiological dysplasia. After two weeks of continuous ventricular tachycardia in the third week, patient's uh, VT become wider, almost as like a sine wave in the ventricular flutter, like morphology. It continues for a few Hour, then patient again went into the cardiac arrest, and then that reverted back to this rhythm. This rhythm shows the junctional rhythm with a rate of 37 bit per minute with a narrow QRL. With the ST change can be noted with a rate to get P in the end of the ST segment. Uh, do you want to comment about this CCD or approach it this way? So I have a question. Why is the P really away from the QRS complex? Really away from? Or do this CCD have any other differential diagnosis? Sir? I mean, why are you considering this as a retrograde P wave? Yes, there is a P wave after the QRS complex. If you look at this P wave, it's negative in V4, V5, V6. If it were a retrograde P wave, it would be negative in 2, 3 AVF, which is, it is, but V4, V5, V6 will be different. So I think it's junction rhythm with at the same time, there's an ectopic, that will be my primary. And second is a remote possibility, because that's a pretty long retrograde conduction time. Um, it can only happen if you have a retrograde slow pathway, which, which is it's a 600 milliseconds. So I think this is, this is just um, um, atrial uh, pedicardia. This is, the case is like going into end stage cardiomyopathy. Yes. The voltage Voltage is getting worse. This is a fascinating case. This should be published. Yeah. So we are planning to publish this. Beautiful case. Thank you, sir. And the, look at this, Hafiz, that this case survived. I don't know what will happen to her. Is she alive or not? Still alive. But five years now without a defibrillator. Yes, sir. That's what I'm saying, everybody. That's what I'm saying. This is this, this, this recognizing a 
it is very important to recognize a problem first. Not recognizing a problem is a big trouble. This case had a lot of elements that should have warned that this is a not our common garden problem in cardiology. This is an exceptionally, you know, and it has clues. That's why it is upsetting to me. It did leak the clues. Well, uh, can I ask something? When this patient first came, what was oh. the presentation in 2000 with that tachycardia? What was the symptom? Uh, that time the patient came with the chest pain, palpitation, shortness of breath, and features of heart failure. No, but what was the reason she, she decided to come to the hospital? Chest pain? Mainly chest pain. Chest pain. Yes. So, you know, one, I'm just wondering that is it possible this patient was in tachycardia, persistent tachycardia? And only reason she came when she had chest pain and that tachycardia may have caused the left-sided dysfunction. This is just uh, something that we need to keep in. We see patients with atrial flutter rate of 180 or so, never has any symptom until they develop heart failure and come to the hospital with CHF symptom. Because right-sided dysfunction can be explained by arrhythmogenic dysplasia, but the left-sided cannot be. So it is a possibility that we need to keep in mind. And that is supported by the fact that when the patient was given amiodarone, the um, VT disappeared and, and probably that contributed to the improvement of the ejection fraction. Sir, at this point, yeah. if the patient accept the AICD, is it reasonable to put it or how to put it, sir, as because the patient has got the RV from that? Well, RV thrombus is not a contraindication to putting a um, RV lead. Uh, because what will happen? You, you know the size, the, this has been there for a long time. It has been anticoagulated. This patient is going to die without a defibrillator. That's the only therapy that can save this patient's life. Um, and so you have to be careful. You tell the patients that, look, there is a possibility this blood clot may dislodge. You assess the size of the clot and put the lead carefully. One of the things that you have to remember with ARVD, um, the chance of perforation is very high when you put an RV ICD lead. So that's something that you need to keep in mind and probably either use a passive lead or put the lead um, actively in the septum so that uh, your chance of perforation will be less. I will be less so, worried about the clot than- so uh, Rebai, uh, will, yeah. you, will you consider other things? The, the RV thrombus, you know, at that point it will be accepted. I'm I'm a little nervous that the RV lead and the dislodgement with the manipulation because we go blind. Will you consider like alternative route, like epicardial lead or sub Q? Uh, yeah. Uh, the question is the sub Q ICD uh, versus epicardial. Epicardial ICD leads are not very effective. No, I'm Again, saying in this case because I don't think you will find many surgeons even to do the epicardial lead. I for see. the ICD. Sub-Q, what about sub-Q? Sub-Q sub is a possibility, but efficacy-wise, it will be less. Again, this patient also has bradycardia. You will need pacing in the atria. So that's other thing that you have to keep in mind. I mean, yeah. I will worry about this lead, but you know, it depends on how you put the RV lead. Um, yeah. If you go gently, if you know how to do it, that means you take the lead, you gently drop it into the right ventricle, as opposed to you just go wild in the RV and get poking around. So it depends on the technique. I mean, if I have this case, I'll explain it to the patient and I'll probably do it. And, uh, and also we, we can look at the thrombus, how organized it is. I mean, it has been there for quite some time. So by this time it should got organized. But the question is why that, that the, the clot kind of kind of puzzling to me. Sir, uh, can we consider CRTD? Though the patient have a narrow complex? Oh, the question is CRTD. First of all, LV function has improved. So number one, number two, narrow QRS. I, I, we never put, um, because if there is no desynchrony, why should I desynchronize? Exactly. So this, uh, concept of narrow QRS um, 
complex with this synchronization that doesn't make any sense to me uh, uh, in uh, while doing the icd uh, it's better to avoid go to towards the rvot what we routinely go for uh, pulmonary artery during uh, putting rv lead that should be gently go to the apex isn't it sir no 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 Direct we apex. i never go to the uh, pulmonary artery I mean, okay. the way to do it is you carve a stylet. I'm sorry for the general audience, this has become a little technical. So you take a U-shaped or semi-U-shaped stylet. Yeah. As you are pushing the lead in, gradually keep withdrawing the stylet and it will gently drop into the apex. Yes. Unless the heart is very rotated. So that's the technique and you can put a lead in without producing a single PVC, even if you, if, if you do it. Yes. Um, slowly, uh, um, the old technique of putting this RV lead in the, I, I have never done it. Some people still do it. I mean, going to the pulmonary artery and then dropping it in the apex, it doesn't make any sense to me, but that's of course one of the techniques. You can do it without going to the Thank you. So one comment I wanted to make sure that, you know, the, when we deal with the, you know, common garden cardiomyopathy and then LV function gets better with aggressive reverse remodeling drugs, but the RV does not get better. That is, and that should be a red flag that why the LV is getting better. So this is like another sign in this patient that the LV is somewhat better, but the RV is, is, is deteriorating. So the, if you tie this up, that just a little bit of a step back and thinking, a lot of signs were there. And it was surprise, it was no surprise to me that we see this um, RV still bad. And actually, if you think about this patient, progressively RV was getting worse and yeah. the dilatation was getting worse. Um, so that should have been another big thing, you know, and then go back, uh, particularly how well the whole story was kept. I would actually thank the patient if the patient kept the records. Uh, of all these EKG, I really do. But if the hospital system kept the record, I actually congratulate the hospital system. Whoever did it, this is an uh, excellent record keeping. Cool, and sir, uh, the full documents are kept by Dr. Atik Rahman, sir. He kept this whole record from 2015 to this five years. What an excellent job. Uh, do we proceed to make yes. slides, sir? Yes. So patient in between, after two weeks of continuous VT, after junctional rhythm, to again patient develop in between for VT to stabilize VT again to junctional rhythm for one week. So total three weeks patient was staying in situ in our hospital. So before I any a question, give any question to the uh, panel of experts. I want to show some blood parameters. During this whole time, the potassium level of normal, magnesium of normal, creatinine was go high from 1.8 to 3.5 to 3.6. Bil bilirubin liver function also altered. Bilirubin was 3.7. LGPT ASP also altered. After we started the enoxaparin, injection enoxaparin, Blood count goes down from 160 to 45. So we decided to shift the anticoagulation from enoxaparin to warring. After one day of giving warring, the 2.79, it goes up to 4.1. So we have to stop the warring again. Uh, throughout the time, TSS was still high. So now our dilemma is, and the question is, the how to regard the VT and the best choice of anti-arrhythmic drug in this case. Sir. Well, so the question is, I mean, uh, first of all, after you have started MU, you can't give anything else. And that's probably the best drug, but the patient needs an ICD. And if you look at those episodes that you just showed, they appear to be bradycardia dependent. And one of the beat you can clearly see, um, if you go back, that uh, uh, there is a QT is pretty prolonged. So if there is a dual chamber uh, pacemaker, um, that would keep the rate up, the, the telemetry strips. 
उसके लिए मिक्स कीजिए जाओ नेक्स्ट वन पॉपी दिस वन यस इफ यू लुक एट द द लास्ट स्ट्रिप इन द बॉटम एंड द वन अबव इट यू कैन सी द फर्स्ट देयर आर टू प्रीमैच्योर बीट सेकंड बीट हैज अ रियली प्रोलोंग क्यूटी um almost like that there is a bit trying to come out and next devil says this looks like probably bradycardia is making this arrhythmia so i think having a dual chamber device facing the atrium keeping the rate high up and then giving amiodarone hopefully will control i mean we are a little bit and after that if it keeps coming back then you can always go for ablation because the vt is originating from the uh, uh, i mean then again it's it's a tough situation uh, we have done cases where we will do ablation for recurrent vt but the problem is i want yeah. to make a comment i think at this point it is important to discuss end of life with the patient family because i think this is painful but i think overall we are not getting anywhere and i, I really uh, that is my opinion but i think uh, this is uh, Uh, overall if we realistically the survival of this patient is hardly more than 6 months let alone one year so um, it is not a bad thing to discuss about end of life i would have agreed with you if the lv function was not good because this patient's lv function is better now okay so, so in cardiology i have a different philosophy if the rv goes down whole cardiology goes down yes if lv there is a hope but we always go and extract if the rv is in nowhere i mean if you think about this rv it is hugely dilated rv thrombus and patient is probably on pressure support at this point i guess and unless you have a rv bailout plan this is not going to go anywhere what is the symptomatically in between arrhythmia how is the patient sir not so good patient is hypotensive sir and yes, patient so is continuously on the nodded exactly i think it's a little bit late in the game basically as hafiz mentioned that the, the person has survived more than 5 years without any invasive treatment that and the, one of the thing that you have to remember that the what i'm telling is a theoretical discussion but if any patient a long term outcome is not good i do icd before the patient goes home that day i always tell sick patients my theory is when they call me for i said is the patient ready to go home and if they say yes i put the icd the day before that is my philosophy and that rings i think half is will agree with that that if the patient is not ready to go home to lead a normal life i am not going to put icd in but if we have the logistics you know this is this patient is young you can think about doing this papi and then rv dysfunction and then give a bailout rv impeller with a plan to rv but i don't think realistically we can think about that in dhaka okay right so there's a mutation So now the next question is the choice of anticoagulation for this patient. Why warfarin? Sir, so after giving the warfarin one day, the INR goes up from two point seven to four point five. Yes. Sir. This is a, a case of non-valvular AF. So why warfarin? Why not the uh, other newer anticoagulants? There is a huge RV from us. So first choice was the warfarin. For the, so for the when somebody gets their warfarin and then INR shoots, there are two risk situation that is possible. One is the VCOR mutation, and then in the VCOR mutation that can be the wild variety, and then it is a kinetic explanation. The other one is that the LV is uh, the RV is bad and almost hepatic congestion. You have yeah. a baseline hepatic congestion so bad that you may see the INR shoot. so that is a very important then yeah. hafiz yes, i think you missed the, you missed i think you missed the number hafiz before starting anticoagulation inr was 2.9 that the patient all oh, the patient is yeah exactly patient is auto anticoagulant i will not even think about start i mean 
we will have to rethink and think about the anticoagulation because the patient is already auto anticoagulated. So, Zubik Bhai, let me explain to you why I missed that number because I stepped out because the temporary wear in my <laughs> CC would be lost and placed by an EP. You know why I, I go after the EP guys? I told him to put it permanent yesterday. He said, just put over the weekend. <laughs> and then now I have to deal with this. <laughs> Listen, I, I'll tell you, Hafiz has PTSD because he has an EP person with the mentality of an interventional cardiologist. His <laughs> EP, his electrophysiology in his department should have been an inter because electrophysiologists in America are the most polite people in the world <laughs> because it's the heritage that we have. But his EP doctor, he, I looked at him, I said, this should have been an interventional cardiologist. And that's why Hafiz has PTSD with EP doctors. But, uh, uh, by, also, also, four of in them India, also in India, all I four of them get, get any EP guy who is arrogant. All are very polite. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. yes. You know, come, to, no, no, come no. to our EKG conference. No, I'm, because I can no. give you access to our EKG please, conference. Then please invite okay, me. Okay. Right. You see, yeah. I, I'll go back into history. All the electrophysiologist in America comes from one root. The root was Staten Island Hospital, is a very small hospital. Dr. D'Amato started the EP program during the Vietnam War. All the forefathers of EP trained in one place and then they branched out. Second, the personalities are different um, because this is a different kind of field. So. Uh, if you look at across the world, every time you find an arrogant EP doctor, it, that means he was meant to be an intervention guy, but suddenly by fluke, he became an EP. So that's the history. But anyway, this is an interesting person. I mean, the, with, with auto anticoagulation status, uh, it is a tough situation to anticoagulate. It's not the question of what anticoagulation should the patient be anticoagulated at all. I don't think so, unless somebody has any opinion asking a, a, a INR level 2.79 at the patient getting anti anti uh, anti population at that time before that patient was getting enoxaparin sir yeah 40 OD yes sir but when the placer count is going down from 45 we stop the anti population with enoxaparin and she oh. gets to the sir what is his STPT is raised yes sir the GPK way, bilirubin is 3.7. There, there is some uh, liver malfunction. So yeah, yeah. the error was uh, raised without any um, extensive pathway blocker. Yeah. So, so the yeah, I think what I... is, uh, work on the intrinsic pathway, it's not going to raise the INR. Probably the existing malfunction of the liver led to this 2.9. Uh, INR, and when it is uh, near about three, so no need to give any anticoagulation in this patient. Yeah. Our, our, our target for HCL fibrillation is um, two, uh, two to between uh, 1.5 to 2.5 for prophylaxis of thromboembolism. But uh, as this patient has thrombus, it can be two to three yeah. target uh, INR. But already he, um, this patient has uh, near about three. So target is achieved without any co anticoagulation, no need further anticoagulation in this patient. But if we discharge this patient because patient took a GORB one week day before in the 27th March. So what should we give without any anticoagulation or any other option? Should, no option. Should we ask for uh, follow-up uh, at least um, after two weeks with an IRA. Thank you, sir. The next question is the uh, what advanced treatment option we have for this patient? I think that has been already discussed, isn't it? Yes, sir. It and uh, half is by as half is by saying end of life situations. Yes, sir. So what would we have done to manage this patient any further or that level of treatment? I think the, the story of this patient tells us that whenever we are facing difficulty, we should have heads together, take advice from others and go back to the records as we are doing now and finding out why, what we missed. This introspection and retrospection 
that will actually help us to both enlighten us and help the patient, uh, uh, many more patients properly. Next, Bobby. Sir, this is the third and last case. I think, Bobby. Yes, sir. Rubi, sir, should you? All, already, uh, I think it's almost back. one o'clock. It's time okay. to yes. Bobby, wrap up. I think uh, your cases are excellent, beautiful, and it took long time to discuss about the cases. I think we'll welcome you to in the next session. Excellent presentation and nice demonstration, Bobby. Both the cases are very beautiful and nicely described and presented. Thank you, sir. Thank you for a kind word. So, Rubik, sir? No, I think we should, uh, this is almost one o'clock. We should close the session today. Um, I think this is excellent. This, this case proves uh, that I think this patient now has lived her life and is just, the problem is not the arrhythmia, it is rather the RFE dysfunction, as Hafiz mentioned, which is running its course. It will be similar to having a patient with EF of 5%. Um, on the left side, who has survived five, six years. Um, and uh, short of heart transplant, um, I, I doubt very much there is much to do for this patient. The other thing that we have to worry about the anticoagulation, uh, this, um, remember that platelet count is 45, INR is high. Um, uh, you have to be careful about spontaneous bleeding in this patient. Uh, no, it, it just wrap it up, Adhar Bhai. I think we have beautiful discussion, intriguing case, uh, many points of discussion. And uh, we found out that even the legions are mortals. Uh, we make mistakes, we uh, understand, we go back and find out where we were wrong, what we could have done better. And that's the thing we should learn from these sessions, ECG in clinical practice. Dr. Poppy, really, really beautiful cases. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So thank you again, Poppy Wala, for your nice, beautiful, excellent presentation, demonstration. These are not the two cases, actually two big stories. Really, we are uh, injured the whole presentation. And actually, we had another presentation from Rufik, sir, but we have planned to here from Rufik sir in the next Saturday, just one session before the uh, Ramadan break. That is the next Saturday, Professor, uh, Dr. Rufik Ahmed sir will present his cases and there will be a break for one month. And again, after the Ramadan, uh, we'll start again the ECG study group session. So Rufik sir, next Thank Saturday. You. Okay, see you. Uh, Thank we should... you, Rodian. Thanks, Sarah Hussain's Ribu. Thank you for see your you. excellent Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank Keep... you, Professor, again. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you many. for the, all the topics. Well, thank you very much. Topics are many okay. thanks. Yeah, enjoy the.